Early morning on Loktak Lake in Manipur, the largest body of fresh water in northeastern India. Loktak is best known for its wonderfully unique floating biome called Pumdi. Here, trotting along on top of the floating Pumdi, lives a very handsome deer, the state animal of Manipur, Sangai, the animal that looks at you. Sangai is the Manipuri name for the brow antlered or elves deer, Rusavas LDI LDI, named after Lieutenant Percy Eld, a British Army officer who first described this deer for science early in the 19th century. In the first half of the 20th century, hunting and a steady shrinking of its habitat had pushed Sangai to the brink of extinction. In 1953, tea planter and naturalist EPG spotted a group of just 14 Sangai clinging on somehow in Loktak. The Sangai that live here today are all descended from those 14 founder individuals. Sangai occupy the southeastern edge of Loktak Lake, where the mat of floating vegetation, the Pumdi, is most dense and stable. This area, shown here in green outline, was made into a sanctuary in 1966 and then upgraded in 1977 to become Kaibol Lamjao National Park, the only floating national park in the world. Sangai share their floating habitat with another threatened species of deer, called hog deer. There are wild boar here too, and no major predators to worry about. Researchers from the Wildlife Institute of India discovered that the hog deer of Kaibolam Jao are genetically distinct from the common Indian race of hog deer, and much more like the Southeast Asian subspecies, which was thought to be confined to small pockets in Cambodia and Thailand. Because of its location on the Indo-Burmese border and the richness of the habitat, Kaibul Lamjao is a biodiversity hotspot with an unusual mix of eastern elements. Sangai figureheads adorn royal boats in the museum in Imphal. Sangai have always been important symbols in Manipur, deeply embedded and entwined with the lives of the people. One of the best-loved Manipuri ballets is about a folk hero called Kadeng, who sets out to capture Sangai as a gift for his beloved. When Kadeng discovers that his lover is already married to the king, he sets the deer free at Kaibul Lamjao. And that's why, ever since, this place has been home to the Sangai. For the people of Manipur, Sangai are synonymous with nature. Killing or harming a Sangai is an unpardonable sin. Almost anywhere you look in Manipur, on shop signs and billboards, you'll see the name Sangai, or images of the deer. The most widely read English language newspaper in Manipur? No prizes for guessing. The Sangai Express. Sangai have evolved to become adapted to their floating home on the lake. The Pumdi that covers part of Loktak is basically a mat of reeds, grasses and some other forbs floating on top with their roots trailing in the water. Walking on the Pumdi, as you can imagine, is a wet, squelchy business and Sangai have evolved slightly splayed out hooves that help them walk on the mat without sinking straight through. As water levels fall in the dry season, the entire mat of Pumdi sinks down too, bringing all the roots in contact with the bottom of the lake. This is when the plants on top of the Pumdi receive a fresh dose of minerals and nutrients from below. 
when the rains return and the water rises, the pumbi floats up again, tearing away the roots from the bottom. This repeated process through the seasons is what made the floating marvel that is Loktak. But then, in 1983, the Ithai barrage was made to generate hydropower, and now its turbines needed Loktak Lake to become a constant reservoir of high water. This completely disrupted the natural cycle of the Pumdi sinking in the dry season and floating up again in the rains. Now the Pumdi doesn't sink down anymore, and its plants are not nourished by contact with the lake bottom. Scientists worry that the unique floating ecosystem of the Sangai may have been critically affected by the barrage. The most sensible way to get around in Kaibo Lamjao is by borrowing a flat-bottomed boat from the forest department. This is what scientists from the Wildlife Institute of India in Dehradun have been doing for several years now, since they first began studying the park. The leader of the wildlife research team is Dr. Chongpit Duboy. Along with Padi and Santi Kumar, she is busy surveying Loktak to try and better understand how Sangai use their habitat and how their population is distributed over the Pumdi. The research team divides the park into grids of one square kilometer and then walk along transect lines half a kilometer long. They're interested in all that they see in these square sample plots. Sangai fecal pellets, the density of various species of grasses and forbs, everything. The researchers are understandably concerned about places where the pumdi is thinning out and they take repeated measurements. How many groups? One group, no? One group and 20 counts. Condition of Pumdi is highly degraded. We can see the lower layer of the the lowest layer of the Pumdis being decomposed and falling down. This is one of the reasons Pumdis are being thinning year by year. Because of the Because the Pumdi no longer sinks to the bottom in the dry season, the roots of the plants are not nourished anymore. This is evident as they find more dead roots than is good for the habitat. So they are losing the soil particles also, that is why uh, they are falling off from the main fumdi. This is one of the thin area of fumdi where we can even put our hand and <laughs> fill the lowest layer of the lowest layer of the fumdi. This is they are getting this detached from the main yeah. body uh. and they are falling off. So that is why thinning is taking place. It isn't at all easy to carry out this work on the floating habitat, and you can imagine what it's like in the monsoon. As EPG said, when you walk on the Pumdi, it moves and shakes, and if you disappear through it, into the black, oozy water underneath, you know you have trodden where it is only a few inches thick. At the end of a long day, the team stops at a chai shop to talk about the day's findings. Andrea is another member of the research team who knows the park like the back of her hand. Here, she guides Ravindra, who has specialized in remote sensing and has come from the Wildlife Institute of India to map the national park. It's a lot easier to range over the national park from a drone and see where the Sangai are without getting your feet wet. 
It is also important to know which parts of the Pumdi they congregate in and which parts they avoid. What do the Sangai think of the drone? As a new kind of bird, perhaps? They're alert and perhaps even a bit wary of this new bird. But they don't seem particularly frightened. A few deer move off into sheltering grasses if the drone comes too close and the researchers are careful to try and keep a healthy distance. In this eastern corner of India, the day begins early for everyone, especially for the fishermen. But what's this fisherman cutting grass for? Is this for his cattle, perhaps? Guess again. He's taking this grass back to his fish pond to feed his fish. For the people who live on Loktak, the lake, along with the rivers that flow into it, are vitally important to their way of life. Fish is by far the predominant source of protein and nourishment for the people of Manipur. And it's no surprise that Loktak Lake is host to communities that depend entirely on fishing to make a living. In deeper parts of the lake, fisher folk have found ways of tying together chunks of floating pumdi to form a large circle. It's an imaginative way of catching fish that they call a tapum. Inside the atapum circle, they place a large net weighed down with stones and then bait the fish with rice bran. Atapum isn't the only way of catching fish in Lokta. One thing's certain, there's so much fish in there that almost any method works. Even fixed nets, like these ones, that are set at night and drawn up the following morning. The dry season at Gaibul Lamjau when the tall stalks of reeds and grasses dry out and fall. This is the rutting season of the Sangai. Big male stags in rut think they look most attractive when they're sporting a big thatch of grass on their antlers. And maybe they're right, because it seems to work with the females. Younger stags haven't yet grown a showy rack of antlers, but already they're sparring and pushing matching strength to see who fits where in the hierarchy. Stags in their prime are usually solitary and easily spotted by their dark brown coats and bigger sweep of antlers. Antler trashing is how stags mark their presence and establish dominance in an area. Another way to signal who's boss is for stags to wallow in mud deposit their droppings at fixed spots and urinate on vegetation. It's their way of letting females know they're primed and ready. Breeding Sangai males tend to fend each other off more by putting up a display than by actual fighting. A female Sangai in estrus is pursued by many males. A stag who has established his supremacy over the area follows the female closely keeping other stags at bay. The mating season for Sangai begins in January and reaches a peak sometime in February or March. The dominant stag follows a receptive female closely, never letting her out of his sight. Nothing else matters to him, not even food, until he has mated with receptive females in his territory. 
he mates with a female several times, though the actual event is a very short affair. Forest guards at Kaibul Lamjao are making a bamboo machan, or watchtower, for the wildlife research team. From here, perched high above the grassland, researchers can do a head count of sangai. Machans like this one are made at 30 or so different places inside Kaibo Lamjao. Census work involves waking up long before dawn and getting into position up on the machans early to ensure animals are not spooked by human beings on the ground. Dr. Chongpi and Mirza record the time of each sighting, the distance at which an animal has been sighted, and all other relevant information, like the gender and approximate age of the animal, what it's doing, and so on. For staff at the National Park, patrolling and protection of Kaibul Lamjao and its wildlife is a continuing responsibility throughout the year. But the onset of dry weather in February is the most challenging period. This is the time of year when the tall grasses and reeds dry up and fall, and fires become an ever-present danger. Fire lines have to be cut and burnt. It's hot, sweaty, difficult work but so crucial to the health of Kaibul Lamjao to ensure that fires can quickly be contained. This is when the Pumdi erupts with new shoots, especially inside the fire lines and burnt patches where the lank grasses have been removed by fire. These places now become the favorite haunts for all the ungulates, who gather to feed on the tender new shoots in the early mornings and late in the afternoon. The testosterone frenzy of the rutting season is now a thing of the past. And this is a relaxed time for sangai and hog deer. It's back to feeding and playing now. And females can be seen with fawns of the previous season. In Kaibul Lamjao, sangai share their marshy habitat primarily with hog deer and wild boar. In other parts of India, Wild boar frequent riverbeds and moist spots where they can dig for roots and soft earth. For them, Kaibul Lamjao is almost made to order. Kaibul Lamjao National Park is a tiny park, extending over only 40 square kilometers, and it's surrounded by 36 fringe villages. The people living here depend on resources inside the park. Besides fishing, people use the fringe areas to collect minor forest produce, herbs, rhizomes and grasses, it all adds up to more pressure on an ecosystem that is already fragile.
Santi Kumar works for the Sangai Conservation Project and he's doing a door-to-door -door survey for the Wildlife Institute to collect data on family size, income and how people impact the conservation of Sangai. It would be very difficult to conserve Sangai successfully without involving the local communities because Kaibulam Zhao National Park is surrounded by 36 fringe villages. The conservation project is fully aware that success will depend a great deal on the involvement and willing cooperation of the people who live on the fringes of Kaibul Lamjao. Wildlife managers use the term social fencing to mean that the most effective way of protecting the park and its animals is with the support of the people who live there. And to do this, the project team organizes outreach programs that strengthen community support for conservation. Part of the reaching out to the community is done by organizing veterinary camps for their pets and livestock. Dr. Kim is the vet in charge. She has a special talent for making the veterinary camps warm, friendly occasions. In another village, Padi is looking at the damage done by wild boar to a farmer's crop. His findings will influence the extent to which the forest department will compensate the farmer for his losses. Meanwhile, Mirza is still busy in the field. His aim is to extract DNA from fecal pellets in order to better understand what needs to be done to conserve Sangai in their habitat. We are here for collection of fecal pellets of Sangai and these pellets will be used for extraction of total genomic DNA which will assist us in uh, looking into the population genetics of uh, these endangered species. It's April, and long before most other parts of the Indian subcontinent, the monsoon builds up fiercely in the northeast. Within a matter of days after the rains begin, the land becomes so green it is almost unrecognizable. It is a time of plenty, and Sangai and hog deer make the most of it. Sangai numbers in their only home at Gaibul Lamjao have fluctuated wildly over the decades. There were probably around a hundred Sangai in the 1950s. This number dwindled to just 14 by 1975. Researchers today estimate their numbers to be less than 100. Better than before, but still dangerously low. The Sangai are vulnerable because there is only a single population left in a single place that is prone to flooding, fire, pollution, and human impacts. Scientists at the Wildlife Institute of India recommend that the Sangai must be provided with a second home. And they have identified another wetland close by as a suitable site. Like Loktak, Pumlan Path has a Pumdi with the same species of fodder grasses. And there is high ground nearby for the Sangai to shelter in when it floods. This is the thrust of the new plan, to secure Pumlan Path as a new conservation reserve, where Sangai can coexist with people living there. This is what the people of Manipur deserve 
and what the Sangai, the pride of Manipur, desperately need.